Welcome to Death and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two cousins who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm MK. I'm Monica. And it is midnight and I'm drinking wine, so good luck. Yeah, enjoy here. We, I, uh, I woke up late today and, uh, and then we talked for two hours about life. And now here we are. Yeah, and um, I didn't eat dinner. No, oh, so the one no, I, I, I did. Just kidding. I forgot that I had KFC while I was teaching. I, I love when I eat and I forget that I ate. Yeah. Fun time. It's really Great. fun time. Yeah. We all hope that you guys had a good week. Um, we're not going to go into much with our week because if you are a listener of this, we know that this week's been a mess for many well, different also, reasons. Well, also, this week... It's also weird because our podcasts come out like almost an entire week after we record them. So like, maybe this week's been great. Yeah, maybe it has. I don't know. The week um, that we're filming, though. <laughs> and I, I feel like my my week has just been ugh. interesting. Yeah, I mean it's exam time. It's final exams for my kids, and. They've been going through it this week, my poor little babies. And, but I watched The Prince of Egypt today and I forgot how much of a banger that soundtrack is. That is very fair. That this is week, my, my high point of the week. This week has been uh, very sad for me. I, um, it, it's not, yeah, you were posting you were posting some bull on Snapchat last night. Yeah, well, you know as to why I was posting half of the bull. Um, but I um it's been a rough week. Seasonal depression has uh been quite flavorful. Yo, after- when you're when your normal depression, your seasonal depression, and your COVID depression all hit at once. Mm, that's a whole different flavor that I've never experienced before. And you know what? And I said this on my Snapchat story last night. I said, you know what? I was watching my old TikTok videos of me in the summertime. And I thought that was the lowest moment of my life. I was so wrong. I was literally so wrong. And you want to know what the messed up thing is? Is I'm in like possibly the best relationship I've been in in a very long time. And I have a really great friends. It's like everything externally just seems great. But because this time of year just sucks donkey ding dong for me. I absolutely just self destruct up in my head. So shout out to my boyfriend and my friends for dealing with my absolute hecticness. My gosh, I got my bridesmaid's dress in the mail yesterday. I still haven't tried it on because I know I have to get it tailored and I just don't have time for that right now. And if I try it on, I'm going to be like, oh God, it doesn't fit yet. Oh, um, also, Mary-Kate, whenever I do get married, are you comfortable with wearing, like, charcoal gray slash black? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Because the dresses are... Listen, have, like, are you kidding me? Mandy's making me wear Tiffany blue. Oh, I wore Tiffany blue for my mom's wedding. I still oh, have yeah. the dress. It doesn't fit me. Yeah, it wouldn't fit me either. I'm a fat ass. That my, it's, my, and, like, the, the sad thing is, it's because I was in their wedding when I was 15, so I had not developed fully yet, and, like, after that summer, it was just, like, you went from being, like, a, a C, to double Ds, my guy, so, like, I can never go back. I can never fit into that dress, unless so, I had a brush I tried on, this was a couple of years ago, but I tried on my prom dress. <laughs> Your face. My brother had to rip me out of it. Like oh I my thought, god! Like he basically had to dislocate my shoulder to get it off of me. It's a strapless dress. I tried on my prom dress because when I went to prom, I was it was the thinnest I had been in a very long time, and you can thank depression yeah, for that. Yeah, me too. I was I was bulimic and had no tits. And now look at me. <laughs> I had to, I could fit into my prom dress. I was shocked. I could still fit into my prom dress. You went dress. to prom like four days ago. More like two years ago. Um, next week I'm missing my 10-year high school reunion. 
Oh, damn. Yeah, you've been out of... I forget. We're, like... You're, like, older than me. By a landslide. Hashtag C year is 2010. Hated that. Put that thing away. <laughs> we literally used to spell senior. It's S-E-N-1-0-R. I hate that. Because we graduated in 2010. Oh, you're so cool. We were okay. cool. We were so cool. I'm so bummed that I'm missing it. Like, I've been talking to the girls and we're just like... I will, I will not go back to my 10-year reunion. I refuse. I don't want to see those people. I'm trying my very damnedest to pretend that I wasn't a senior in high school. My senior year, high school sucked for me. I hated it. Like, it wasn't I bad, mean, but it was high school wasn't the best time, but, like, also, the girls I went to, granted, I also, you went to public school. I did not. There was, there was 76 girls in my entire class. Oh, that's spicy. We were the biggest class the school ever had. Jesus. Yeah. Wasn't Bree's year the their year there the well, last, last year? Yeah. yeah. But so yeah, there were seventy six girls in my class. Um, well, now they're seventy five now. Unfortunately, one of them passed away this year. Um, but I still talk to at least I talk to two of them regularly, and I'm still friends with most most of them well that's good i i literally have two friends from high school still that's legitimately it (laughs) like rocking with casey and danielle for way too long and i um so they're they're the only friends that i have um from high school my best friend from high school is who's wedding wedding i just got the dress for you're gonna look so pretty. You better send me pictures, and when I get married, it's I gonna mean, be a time. We'll be at home. I'm not getting. She's not getting married here. She still lives in Niagara Falls. Wes, you still send me pic. Like, send me pictures. Okay. And see, and then when I get married, I have been very in my brain about my wedding. I'm not anywhere near getting married, but. I have had, I, I, I'm going to get your advice, and you know what, everyone who's listening, our three friends who listen to this, um, give me your input as well. Um, there are two options for me to walk down the aisle. Two songs. Sleeping at Last's Turning Page, the instrumental version, or the Ice Dance from Edward Scissorhands. I don't know which one I want. I vote Ice Dance. Ice Dance? Yeah. My grandmother said the same thing. But then when I listen to the lyrics of Turning Page, I'm like, oh, it's such a beautiful song. Because, like, could you imagine loving someone that much? I'm getting married on Christmas. Um, not on Christmas Day, but Christmas. I'm wearing a hooded cape that looks like bells from the Christmas movie. Um, my bridesmaids will be wearing scarlet. And my bouquet will be scarlet and yellow roses. Um... And uh, I will be walking down the aisle to Beauty and the Beast. Um, I better be in a scarlet dress. Um, well, obviously. But, um, yeah, and if any man thinks he's going to change that. Wrong. You're not. No, so wrong. Like, I, I've talked to my boyfriend about it because I have a, a legit Pinterest board saved for my wedding. I have and- three different Pinterest boards for my wedding. I love that. I, the, mine will just accumulate. I want to do mine around Halloween. Mine it just started makes- to get really messy, so I had to make another board. That's fair. That's very fair. Mine's kind of messy. I want to organize it. Um, but I have had a conversation with my boyfriend, and I was like, listen, I know we've been dating for like a month or whatever, and I was like, here's the thing. If you really don't ever want to get rid of me, you need to understand one thing. You ever plan on marrying me, you will have no worries about the planning. I have it. I know where it's happening. I know what time, what day. I said, we won't even need a year to plan. Give me a week and we'll be all, all set. Oh my God. So, do you remember Rosa? Rosa. It so- sounds familiar. Is it one of your friends? No. Damn. It was... One of our uncle's exes. 
Yes. I said I was getting married on December 22nd, and she was like, you can't. That was supposed to be my wedding day. No, that's not right. I want to get like, either married. I was like, I just met you 14 minutes ago. <laughs> you can't tell me what I'm getting married or not. No. Literally, I, I'm, I'm debating on either doing it the week before Halloween or on Halloween. I have not decided. Luckily, I have time to think. I mean, like, like, my dream wedding would be on December 22nd, 2022, so it would be 12 22 but also the chances of me finding someone before December of 2022 is a big, fat, well, no, I can't say zero, because, like, I don't know, but, like, not very high. Yeah, that you're working with two years right now. You could, if you meet I mean, a guy, date for a year, he proposed. I mean, my sister years. got married in 14 seconds. That's also very true. Love that for her. <laughs> Literally love that. I for mean, her. no, like, I mean, genuinely super happy for her, but also it's like, oh, this is, this happened. Great. For you. <laughs> See, I, 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 if I got engaged, I would need, I would need a year to make sure all my ducks are in a row. Um, the, the, the wedding will be taking place. I haven't decided. It's in between Becker Farms or the Bellhurst Castle in Geneva. Ooh. And then we can have the whole bridal party and everything stay at the castle. And I literally will be getting married in the castle, like this beautiful, gothic, gorgeous castle. I mean, I just want to be married outside, but I also want to be married on Christmas. So, and I want my wedding to be in the snow, but then I remember I can't really make people sit outside in the snow. Yeah, that's true. That's why if you get something that has like a beautiful, like, like huge window lining like a whole back wall, so you'll get like the landscape of the snow. And then you know, but you're inside because you're, like, warmth and you're not freezing. I was thinking of, like, those really expensive, like, heater tents. I was also thinking that. And you can also get it clear so you can still see the, the whole thing. And, um, also, I'm letting you know because I think you'd appreciate this. At the reception, if all of you don't plan on, um, coordinating a dance like they did in the office, at my reception, like they did at Pam and Jim's wedding, to Forever by Chris Brown, I will be thoroughly upset, and I will cry. I will absolutely never dance to a song by Chris Brown, because he beats women. That's also very true. We'll choose a different one. We'll do a different song. We'll, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> jury's out on that. The jury's out on that one, yeah. Um, speaking of something the jury is out on, Hemlock Grove. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this episode, it, me and MK both had said that this episode is a lot better, we thought, than last week's, but still not to the ex extent that um, that we were hoping for. We're two episodes in, it's a little slow, a lot of explaining going on, but also none at the same time. Yeah. Um, so this episode is called Gone Sis. It was released on July 11th, 2014. IMDb gave it 7.3 stars, so less than last week, but I, I disagree. I like it better than last week's, yeah, yeah. but only marginally. Mm -hmm. um, it was directed by Vincenzo Natali, who um, is apparently, like, super, super well-known, but I've never heard of him because I don't really pay attention to those things. Um, he, before, like, pre Hemlock Grove, he directed the movies Cube, Haunter, and Splice, which are all apparently, yeah, I have never heard of any of them, but he won a F ton of awards and is, like, really kind of a big deal. And since then, he's, like, pretty big deal in, like, horror TV. He has directed for Orphan Black, Hannibal, The Strain, American Gods, Westworld, and Lock and Key. And I haven't watched Lock and Key yet, which I've is heard kind it's of, super good. Yeah, and also they talk about it's like all time a lot of Tom Savini is involved in it, which I love that. I would oh maybe we should maybe that should be a possibility for a show we do. Yeah, no, I think it's on the list. I got I don't know. I lost the list because I lost the list. Um, and it was written by Jennifer Haley, who, interestingly, 
Last week, I said that I could talk a lot about the story editors, but I chose not to because it would take too much time. Jennifer Haley wrote this episode and one other episode in this season, but she was the story editor on every episode this season. Oh, really? So at least there will be some kind of consistency and continuity because the same person is the head story editor for every episode. Well, that's good. Um, she doesn't really um, do TV. She's a playwright. Um, she's written these episodes of Hemlock Grove and um, she wrote the last five episodes of the first season of Mindhunter. In mind but, Hunter. Yeah, but she is mostly, she is a playwright. That's what she's known for. Um, she wrote this play called The Nether which was an Olivier Award nominee in 2015, which Olivier is like the British Tonys, but it's not really, it's, it's totally, it's its own thing, but it's equivalent really to that. And um, it's this really super intense play about like a VR world and this detective like finds this like pedophile ring inside the VR world. And it's like this whole like look at like losing your morals in this like not because it's not real and like it's deep that's insane oh my god yeah so uh she's kind of but i also find it really interesting that so far we've only had two female writers on the show and they're both very well-known playwrights not television writers yeah that is interesting yeah uh, and for there is uh, about one cool, like, really cool special effects uh, scene in this episode. One I think was more visual than, uh, like... There was, there was also one visual that was very bad. Oh, yeah, and I know. I literally have a note saying, what the hell is that? It, so, was, it was so bad. And, um, so the, um, we're dealing with the same makeup artist from last week, which is Peter Back Patrick Baxter, um, from last week. And he, um, once again, there are, like I said last week, there are other people who work on it. And I think uh, a lot of it, they're all on a film crew um, or a crew that does it. Let me, I didn't write down the name of the. Uh, oh, shoot. You of, just told me the name too. And I can't remember. Masters Effects is a production company that seems to be doing the effects. Um, I hope that, I think this might be something that's also uh, throughout the whole season. I could do a check and let you guys know next week. Um, but it looks like they have like an actual effects department because with them having as much as from what we've heard gore involved in this episode, um, this season, yeah, I feel which, like they, based on the first two episodes, I fully think is true. And it's honest and it's still done tastefully. It's not done yeah. randomly, like senseless. It all kind of coincides with the story yeah. that's, um, I just think that they upped their ante with making it look a little bit cooler, which I kind of. I, I also went on a random deep dive today about the composer because I was thinking about how much we talked about how great John Carpenter's music was when we did Halloween and how I actually really, really like the theme music for the show, which turns out that makes sense because it was nominated for an Emmy for best theme music. Um, yes. But it was all done by this guy named Nathan Barr, who is a horror composer. Um, he worked with Eli Roth on the Hostel movies and um, Cabin Fever, and that's pretty much how he got the job doing Hemlock, because he is good friends with Eli Roth, and he has did the score for all of the um, score music for season one and two. So mm -hmm. not, so obviously like, incident, or the, um, not incidental, the like, like that song that sounded like an MGMT song from the finale last time and like the song songs are obviously he didn't do but all of the score music like so Olivia's theme and the wolf theme and the, the theme song he did all of those but as I was doing more research into him I realized that not only does this man write a lot of um music for horror stuff he's one of the few composers that he plays all of the instruments for his music like he doesn't hire an orchestra he plays every part himself mm -hmm. um cool. And uh, the theme song is done, I figured out the reason I like it so much is it's done only on cello, because why wouldn't I like that? Um, no. But he um, happens to be one of the people who also collects rare instruments made out of 
human bone. He owns a, a trumpet made out of a femur. I can't imagine, like, is it actually playable or is it just a decorative thing? I didn't, I didn't quite find that. Because um, it looks like, if so, he hired Jeffrey Dahmer to do some decorating skills for his house. I just really want to know, like, when you die, like, when I die, can I, like, donate my body to music? And, like, they can make music out of my bones? Right. Like, if, oh, if you can, if my femur can make a playable trumpet, please do that. Yeah. If anyone knows anything about that, let me know, because I will donate my body to it right but now. But also, you can make music out of a lot of things. I was just watching the last episode of Amazing Race from this week. They were in Paraguay, and they went to this orchestra that's made, it's, the this, this Spanish translation is the Orchestra of the Reclaimed. They basically make all of their instruments out of things in a landfill, in a dump. Really? And that's cool. It's super cool. So apparently, you can make a cello out of a gas can and a trumpet out of a human femur. The more you know. The more you know. And I would say with the more we know, the more in this episode, Roman is starting to uh, know about himself with his little uh, habits of being a vampire. This this episode, um, I've told Mary-Kate this, I feel like they did a good job explaining some questions, but also leaving us with more questions than we started. Um, so our blurb says, Roman invites an outsider to be his guest. Destiny attempts to bring clarity to Peter's dreams. Olivia grows frustrated adapting to her ailments. Yeah, we definitely do see a different side of Olivia this season, uh, this episode, which I think it's going to carry out through the rest of the season. Um, or, or at least a good hunk of the season. I shouldn't say all of it because, I mean, based Olivia on, was... Based on the blurb for next episode, I'm very excited to see where Olivia is going. Oh, I didn't even read the blurb for next week's episode, so... I, I didn't really mean to. It just popped up when you were... It just when I, when I stopped the episode, it just, it popped up, and I was like, oh, oh. Because there's a very big word in it, and you know how I feel when I see big words. <laughs> Especially in Hemlock Grove, because it's probably just, you know, Olivia writing... There was it. one word in this episode that I had to look up. Really? Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. Um... For our cold open on uh, in this episode, we have um, Roman in a car with a girl who oddly reminds me of Knives from, uh, like, if Knives and Ramona Flowers had a child from Scott Pilgrim, like, this was this girl. Like, they really you know, I didn't even catch the fact that they were in the car. I was too busy trying to figure out why the, the prostitute was walking the way she was. I was like, what's wrong with her? Did she just pee outside? Um, Roman is currently looking to get freaky, uh, with prostitute, and apparently he's a, he's a customer of her a lot, and he hasn't been with her in a bit, and she makes it known. He's like, well, it's been a while since you, you've come and seen me. What did you, I think it was Rich Boy, or something like that? Yeah, she called him Rich Boy. Yeah. And so they go into the hotel room, she starts to take off her clothes, and there is no, a, no. a- Hotel is way too generous of a word. That was, a motel at best very true um there's some retro porn playing on the tv and uh she's just taking her clothes okay if you're gonna go to a sketch motel to bang one out why do you gotta also watch porn i know like you're literally there to have so is it to like your intentions are pretty uh pretty known i mean i'm like unless you can't get in the mood without porn but then like i feel like that's not it's not your biggest problem. Exactly. And so she starts to get undressed, and Roman notices a bunch of bruises on her, and he's like, so, your boyfriend person, he's, like, hitting you again, aren't you? You're still with him. She's like, well, I thought you liked my bruises, and we actually got married, and, and he's like, oh, um, okay, uh, get off me. <laughs> and no, uh, He doesn't just say get off me. He starts to, like, let her play, and then he's sniffing her neck, and then he realizes, fuck, I'm going to kill her. So I got to kick her out just like I kicked the chick out of my car last week. And um, leave. Yeah. And then, so he's like, I'm not in the mood. And then she's like, we still got to pay. And then they have, like, some weird disagreement. Not even really. Like, it never got the sense that. No, it really wasn't even.
and a disagreement. It was mostly that he was just like, yeah, not going to pay. I didn't get anything. And so she went to go get her husband, boyfriend, pimp, Davey. What a name. What a tragic being called Davey. But also, like, when he walked in the room, 130% was not what I was expecting him to look like. Oh, yeah, same. But it made sense for the name. Yeah, I just was like, what? He looked, he looked like your math teacher that has, um, that, that a lot of kids don't like to stay afterwards in his room. Like, that's the vibe that he got. Like, as soon as that bell rings, everyone leaves, like, together. Like, no one gets left behind. He me that reminded vibe. me, he seemed like, so I've never really watched Breaking Bad, but I always have this, like, image of how Walter must have been at the beginning when he like first stopped being a chemistry teacher and started being a drug dealer and like his attempts to be intimidating in a drug world when he was really just like a dude. That's the vibe I got off of this guy. That's like a, he beats a- like he beats women because he can't beat up other men. Yeah. That's what he looks like. Walter would never, but No, of course. No, no, no. But like that like not quite as intimidating as he thinks he is kind of vibe yeah and um so the the um they start to talk and he's like i'm not paying i didn't get anything he's like well we all keep a deposit he's like i could give you another girl if there's something wrong with this one so we clearly know he has some sort of like prostitute ring oh yeah he's a pimp and so he's like i can give you another girl blah 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 and then yo and then roman comes at him i was actually cracking up he was like do you have anybody who's type A? And he was like, oh, talking about this one girl who was clearly like a type A personality. And he was like, no, I mean, blood type A, B, O negative, doesn't really matter. Double munches on this dude's neck. He said, let me get a taste. And it was, um, remember how we talked about the show has uh, upped the gore? It was bloody yes yes it was and the thing um well while he's he bites him and then he you know is done biting him and doing what he has to do lights a cigarette puts a towel over his neck yeah hands him a towel and just lights up a cigarette while his entire like it looks like he has a santa claus beard of blood yeah like he said like he really he's a messy eater so Like, uh, well, eh, I'm not a vampire, so I wouldn't know if that's normal or if it's messy. But um, he, uh, after that, um, the, the, the intro starts to start. And the thing that, <laughs> and so I was telling Mary-Kate, and I was like, at first when I was watching the scene, I was thinking, well, they're going to know it was him, and they're going to call the cops. And I was like, but wait, it's a prostitution ring. They're not calling the cops at all. Right. My note for that whole intro, like, that whole open scene was, like, at least he's killing with, like, morals. Like, he was going to kill the prostitute, but then when he realized that the prostitute was getting beaten, he was like, there's somebody who's even worse than a prostitute. Like, not saying prostitutes are bad. Pro sex worker, but, like... Nobody's really going to miss a prostitute. Yeah. Which is a horrible thing, but, like, most of the time they have run away from life and are not truly going to be missed by families. Yeah, and that's a whole other discussion that's just sad as hell to think about. Right, 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 right. So, but he was like... Let me kill this actual piece of shit. Yeah. So, like, at least he's killing with morals, question mark. The, the, it's like he's like he's vampire batman he's batman vampire <laughs> <laughs> there was this little boy who lived next door to grandma and papa and his nickname was fat man like p-h-a but like he was like three or four and papa stan used to call him batman because he didn't get it <laughs> And he'd be like, come on, Batman, we're going to the pool. <laughs> and we were like, Papa, his name is Batman. And then we, Papa's like, 
He's four. He's not a fat man. I don't know. I love that man so much. Oh, oh, I love him so much. Like, oh, I miss him. Rest in peace, Donut Man. Papa Donuts. Love that man. Oh, that man, we're going to the pool. <laughs> um, oh, we're still at the cold opener. We were recording for almost 40 minutes. <laughs> this is a problem. Um, so, we get through the, the uh, title thing. And now we're at the point where we're seeing Roman clean up at his house, his, the oh, aftermath. Yeah. I didn't write any and notes about that. The only note that I had written, I was like, so he didn't drink his blood. Me and Mary Kay had talked about this before we started recording. Um, it looked like he threw up or like was spitting out blood and it was like a lot of blood. So I was like, oh, maybe he didn't want to con- ingest it. Like, but he, it's, it, it, it just didn't make sense to me. Like, cause it's already in your sick. Like, yeah. So it. what I thought was happening was that it was just because the camera was basically inside the sink and you were looking up at his face and I thought it was just him washing the blood off of his face and like spitting out like whatever was like left on his face teeth while he was cleaning Mm -hmm. and that that's also fair we don't 100% know because it couldn't really tell Um, but also like it doesn't really matter it was a cool shot yeah it really was it was honestly really really dope um, and then he gets a knock on his door. Uh, no. No. Well, yes, for him, but, you know, there's, um, a chick driving in her car, and this girl, we don't know a lot about her, but so far I think she's me. Um, she's listening to, like, ridiculous rock music, and she just broke up with her boyfriend, and she's listening to his voicemails and, like, talking shit to him. Not really, because she's just talking to her voicemail, but, like, but then this car starts like coming behind her and like riding really close to her tail and she gets really scared and she like swerves to go to a different street and like turns on the radio and turns on classical music and is like trying to calm down and then out of nowhere the car comes and t-bones her and I was like yo this dude is trying to kill her Mm -hmm. and exactly and this is where we get to the the scene where uh she, I, I'm assuming the wreck happens fairly close to Roman's house because yeah, she says it happens like right outside his house. So she um, knocks on Roman's door and uh, he post cleanup of a murder, and uh, she he opens up the the door and she's like, right. She literally looks like she wasn't even in the car act. She like it looks like she got into well, a well. No, the side of her face is bleeding. And she's got, like, blood all coming down her face, and she's standing, and it's raining, and she's, like, standing in the pouring rain. Like, so she's soaking wet and dripping blood. Yeah. But and also, based on the fact that she was T-boned by a truck that was deliberately trying to hurt her, the fact that she's got a cut on her forehead is the only damage we see is a little sus. Yeah, like, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't know if it's just lack of effort in that department of making it seem like, oh, that, like, that's a scene, like, that's a wreck that you'd be like, oh, you stay in the car, the police come and find your car. Like, you don't get out and walk down the road to find someone. Yeah, except for that she explains why she did. Oh, she yeah, explains she that she doesn't have any car insurance and she doesn't really want to deal with the police. Mm-hmm. Um, so which is honestly a little sketch in itself like right no 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 i'm i'm not saying i definitely think there's more going on with her but i'm that she does explain why she got out of the car accident out of the car Mm -hmm. um Um, it just seems like like what i was like i guess trying to say was that with the force that that truck was coming at her it's not that i don't i understand why she wanted to and why she did but i don't see how it was possible for her to because yes. from how fast that car was coming at her, right? There, you know, I don't understand how she's alive, and let alone only got out with a scrape on her head. Um, the thing yeah. that confused me about this was so okay. So he does at first. He like kind of seems like a dick, and he like doesn't let her come inside. And he's like, "Okay, I'll call for you," and shuts the door. And then he comes back and opens the door and lets her inside because he's still trying to figure out how to be a person when he's not a person anymore. Mm -hmm. um and so she's in there on the phone and everything and roman has a butler 
And that kind of threw me off for a second. Cause like, obviously he's lived his whole life with servants and cleaning people and everything. And like, that's the lifestyle he's accustomed to. But also this dude is off like feeding on prostitutes. Mm-hmm. What does the butler think is going on? Like I'm confused. I honestly think they know something that's going on. Clearly, if they're having, like, a nanny watch this baby in a soundproof room, like, I think yeah. that they have to know normal. No, I, if I was at Butler, I would be drunk all the time just to deal with that. Honestly, I don't blame you. I really don't. Um, now, we, we as she, she calls tow service, tow service is, like, eh, obviously not. In She's like, so much for 24-hour towing, but also, like, you're in Hemlock Road. Exactly. And um, as someone who got into a car accident in the middle of nowhere, I can tell you, good luck. Yes. Um, now I think we go it's to Peter the next morning. No. Get, no. No. The next scene is at the <clears throat> greenhouse where oh, Olivia yeah. is gardening, and a bird flies at the window and hits it and dies, and Olivia starts crying. Yeah. I was like, very confused. Olivia, I wrote down three times in my notes. Olivia is really going through it. Like, Olivia is having a very hard time. Like, her rough exterior is, like, dwindling. I wrote, is and, Olivia for real crying over a dead bird? Yeah. And honestly, we get, an, we get an explanation for it in a later scene with her. Yeah, we get an explanation in it for it in the very next scene Olivia's in. But, like, I was like, oh. It's just seeing Olivia care about things. She has, she has feelings? Exactly. She has feelings um, that are not inappropriately sexual toward her son? Exactly. And bold. It's a bold thing for Olivia to be doing. Then we go to Peter. And uh, Andreas has showed up. Mm-hmm. He's, he's like, I drove all night. I wanted to be with my destiny. And she was like, bitch, you needed a place to stay. But also, phone me again. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, I literally wrote back, man's is back for destiny. That didn't take too long. Um, then, oh, then Peter is on his way to work, but first he stops at prison to visit his mom. And, um, he can't visit his mom because she's in the hole, uh, Cause she beat up a corrections officer, which doesn't seem like Linda. Doesn't seem like Linda. And Peter doesn't think it seems like Linda either. And he's like, something's going on. Somebody's messing with her. And they're like, well, sucks to suck. Because uh, we have the best prison system in America. Yep. And um, after uh, that, then he heads to, um, then I'm trying to remember because my notes are kind of sporadic and I didn't write. Yeah, mine too. Things. But yeah, I believe the next he goes to work, he gets yelled at by our hateful taxidermist about being late. Right. Um. Or is the next scene in between them? I hold on because I'm trying because I think I wrote down. It's after the, the scene with Olivia and Price, because I wrote down a, a note about the car in the other scene. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I was like, I, I have no notes about that scene. So, yeah, um, so then we go back to Olivia, and she is in PT with Price, and she is telling him this story about a dream, about when a time that she lied to Roman about frosting for a birthday cake, but she never really made him a birthday cake, and she was like, crying and he was like so uh the side effect yeah he's like the side effect of the drug that you're on right now is um something about like empathy but like something of not not just about empathy but it was about like it makes you like empathetic because of i think a state of nostalgic or like yeah like having like these and she was like, I don't like it. Make it go away. And he's like, no. He goes, it's a pleasant, it's a welcome uh, change from your, uh, from your normal sociopathy. 
I was like, Price out here calling out Olivia. Right, like, Price is being real bold this season. I'm kind of here for it. Honestly, same. Like, I'm like, Price is like, I'm like, I, I don't know if I want to trust you yet. Right, but I, know, I still don't know if I'm on Team Price, but, like, I'm, I'm here for him just saying shit. Exactly. And, um, so yes, um, like, Olivia really, really going through it, apparently, because of this drug that she's on. And um, then they start discussing Roman and how he's doing and how he's handling it. And um, she, this is when I had to look up a word. She's asking um, Price, like, how things are. And she says, has there been any detritus? I was like, this man A hollow hoop of what? It means debris or waste. Ah, so Olivia's so speaking like, like basically, have you, has, has he been leaving a trail of bodies? And Price is like, not that I have, I'm aware of, and not that law enforcement's aware of. So mm -hmm. she's like, proud of him for being careful. Yeah. Then Price back at it with the sass. She's like, I need to, him and I share these cravings. I need to go to him. He like, we need to talk about it. And um, Price is like, the only person your son hates more than me is you. Yeah. He's like, no, he needs me. Olivia is really like constructing a whole reality in her head at the moment. She's emotional AF right now. She, wow. Like I've never seen Olivia ever have this much emotion, I think ever. And it's kind of, kind of interesting. I mean, granted, it's medically induced, but like, I'm here for it. You know, like, if Olivia was, like, as much of, like, a crazy, psychotic, like, crackhead in the show as that she is, if she had some feelings, like, I think I would be able to like her a little bit more. Yeah, no. Um, then we go to Roman buying a horse, and uh, the guy who's selling him a horse is talking about how he used to ride horses with Roman's dad, and... He's like, what happened to all the ponies your dad used to have? And he's like, my mom slaughtered them all. And the guy's like laughing and he goes, oh, <laughs> you're not. <laughs> and the horse's name is called Beautiful Dreamer. Beautiful Dreamer, welcome to me. Okay. Uh <laughs> it's the wine, y'all. It's the wine. I'm sorry. Um now I think is when we go to the shop. Yes. Yeah. And so this is when Peter comes in, his taxidermist boss is yelling at him for being late. And he's like, to go give the pretty girl the bad news. And the pretty girl is our pretty girl who was at Roman's house the night before. Well, at this point, we do already know her name because she, in the voicemails from her boyfriend, it says her name. So we learn her name before she ever talks. Her name is Miranda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I forgot. Another reason why I think she's me is when she's first at Roman's house and there, she's and she, it's like awkward and she's inside the house. She was looking at this painting. She's like, I love expressionism. It's so violent and dark. And then he gives her a funny look. She goes, okay, well, I'm gonna go now. <laughs> <laughs> um, now that they're at the shop, uh, Peter goes and tells her about her car, what's wrong with it. And me and Mary Kate said that everything that's wrong with it and for the frame to not be destroyed oh. is, yeah. there's no, I, I don't know if people knew about like mechanics or things like that when they were writing this scene because it I doesn't make sense. I have been in an unfortunate amount of car accidents because I can't drive. Um, and yeah, that's not possible. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so that car wreck, just not even scientifically possible. No. Um, but basically, Peter's like, listen, I'm going to be a good guy. I'm going to help you find used parts so you don't have to pay as much for the car because I get it because you're a runaway and I'm a runaway and we have that in common. And there was, and she looks a little bit like Letha and he was having feelings. And literally my only note for their entire interaction for the episode was Peter better not start boning Miranda. 
it's gonna happen. Watch, there's gonna be a love triangle between Miranda, Peter, and Roman, and that's how Peter and Roman become. I don't know, you're probably right. That face is <laughs> not because I'm disagreeing with you. You're just accepting the sad reality that that's what's gonna happen. I just. <laughs> I just want to punch Peter in the face sometimes. Yeah, who doesn't? <laughs> but the scenes definitely do take a turn for the next one because uh, Olivia's at the Godfrey building. Yeah. I don't know that, but it's like, you know what? I'm going to not, I, because I'm feeling things and I have empathy for once in my life, I'm going to reach out to Roman and not be stubborn and wait for him to reach out to me because you know damn well he won't. You know yeah. The, yeah. And with the first second that she's in there, Roman hits the intercom and goes, uh, I don't, I think so. He says, whoever told you I was a patient person was wrong. Yes, thank you. But I'm also, sorry. he's not talking about Olivia. He's talking about his food. He's waiting for food. Oh, oh. And they, and they bring in the food, and then he's pissed because he wanted raw liver, but they cooked the liver. And he's like, why is this cooked? And the lady's looking at him funny. And he's like, whatever, it's fine, I'll eat it. And so he's eating it, and Olivia's like, Yeah, and she's like, I know what you want. And the thing that I have to give, like, Peter, not Peter, Roman is taking zero of Olivia's shit at the moment. Right. But Olivia tries her best to explain to Roman what Price is doing without being like, this is exactly what Price is doing. Right, but also, like, she's, I'm kind of on Olivia's side in that moment because she's like, listen, like, au pairs, like, we've had to run away and hide for centuries until I married us into the White Tower. I did what I needed to do so that we would be protected and we could stay and we didn't have to always be on the run. And then Roman delivers my favorite line, I think, ever. He's like, I kind of figured you'd fucked and finagled your way. Yeah, he's, at least you've admitted it. Yeah. Fucked and finagled your way through the centuries. And, and honestly, honestly like, I want that on my tombstone. I love that. Just Mary Kate, here lies Mary Kate, the woman who fucked and finagled her way through the centuries. <laughs> um, so, but like, I, I, um, I do think that was a good thing that she kind of gave him some insight as to what's happening, um, without completely spoiling everything. I it's think- It's definitely gonna break down the barrier between the two of them, but it's just not gonna be as easy as she wants it to be. Exactly. Eventually, and he, eventually he's going to need her help. Mm -hmm. well, but, but it's Roman, so he'll take his he'll, he'll take his sweet ass time. Yeah, yeah and it'll, it'll be like a do or die situation. He'll be like, I really have zero choice but to ask my mother for help. But the thing about that scene, like the note that I took, it, I just wrote that Roman hates being a new peer. Like he is like, I just want to be normal. I just want to be a person. And he said, and she was like, you can't be normal. You're my son. And he said, I would literally give anything to not be your son. Yeah, and also Roman was also mad that she was like, and you try to make me kill my daughter. And yeah. she, so, oh, so you were right. I was thinking that she was trying to give Roman like what she had with Roman, but it was more like she was trying to have him do what she did with Juliet. Yeah. And because this baby, I'm assuming, doesn't have the call then, I would assume. I guess. I would, yeah. Um, she has so, something though. Her eyes are way too blue. But also, like, okay, so, spoiler alert, because honestly, I don't care about going in order, really, because it doesn't really change anything when things are not connected. Um, but, so, toward the end of the episode, the baby is screaming and crying, and she won't drink any formula. And he's, Roman's, like, telling the nanny, he's like, try a different one. She's like, I've tried all of them. And she's like, we find out that the baby's nanny was also Roman's nanny. And she's like, you were the same way when you were a baby. Like, you just cried and you're hungry for something I can't give you. So there's, so the baby has, is something. Yeah. So what? But. So probably the blood kink when she's like 18 and then she'll be a vampire eventually. Yeah. You know, for her 18th birthday. Yeah. And, um, and so, um, after, 
uh, Olivia has this conversation with Roman. She goes down into the lab where Price is having all these experiments done and the Russian doctor's down there and she's like, uh, are you allowed to be down here? I don't think you are. I was uh, mad because there was like a whole scene that was just more stupid Russian. And in this scene with the stupid Russian. Yeah. And is the it, worst CGI I've fun. ever seen. So bad. First of all, there's there's a question, as I wrote down, what the fuck is that? And for for two purposes, there she's doing like these experiments on these blob fleshy things in these trays, which I thought were like it looks like a baby, but the other ones just look like blobs. I don't really know. And so then she goes to check into the last container, and there's this really awful CGI blob thing just squig squeaking on the floor. Yeah, the CGI squeaking on the floor was bad, but you, the worst moment was Olivia picks it up and the obviousness of the cgi being a, like a totally different like camera like it was like they didn't even do it in the same pixels as the rest of the sh movie like yeah. show it was it looked like it was something out of a pixar movie put in real life oh my god it was so bad it was very bad and plus like it was like wiggling while she had to also don't insult pixar like that it looks like it was one of those knockoff disney movies that it's like frozen but they call it cold They call it cold. <laughs> I mean, that's very true. It's very, very true. At least Pixar takes time to like <laughs> animate the scene on everyone's <laughs> clothes. <laughs> that's very fair. I I will take that back. It's worse. It's way worse than yeah. that. Um, um and but, so, it's a little rough to see. But so Olivia is like, I need to talk to Dr. Price. And she's like, I talked to Rome. And he's like, how did it go? She's like, let's discuss this over a snack. And he takes her to some secret room where apparently all of her diet has been. And we find out that he really is feeding Which, her. I have a theory or a question more so. What is, I'm assuming because like he is helping them in a way so that they don't kill in, like conspicuously. So are these things, these people that he's making, Ouroboros, all this stuff, just people for her, like, her- That's what I was thinking. I think he's making an army of in artificial humans to feed her, but also, that doesn't a lot seem of in line with the way he was talking to Clementine at the end of last season, and I'm very confused. So maybe Ouroboros isn't what that is, but he's had made experiments of things that have blood in it. Yeah. That well, he said something about, like, they're better when they're fresh or something, and I was like, what the? I don't know. He but yeah, we don't, we don't get to go in the room with Olivia. We just see her excitedly walk in. Exactly. And um, then they, uh, they eat. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember how, because I know Olivia and Price reconvene, I think, is it after uh, Norman and Marie? Or is it before Norman and No, Marie? it's before. Four, I think. I think it's just, or maybe it's after, but it doesn't really matter. So they, after they eat, they leave, and she's like telling Price all the stuff about how she like told Roman everything, and he threw his arms around her and thanked her, and they're reunited, and she's so happy he has, a, she has her son again, and he was like, "I think you are experiencing dissociative euphoria." Yeah. And she's, she's really, like, experiencing this whole other reality in a way, thinking that her and Roman are perfect, wonderful, he loves her to death, and he literally wants her dead. Like, he doesn't want her alive. Yeah. And then we get to Norman and Marie talking, which it seems like a normal conversation, which is odd for the two of them. They're cheersing over something, I can't remember what it was. Um, oh, they're cheersing over the fact that their lives are falling apart. He has a, a bottle of scotch in his desk, and she's like, keeping a bottle of hooch at work, like, isn't that one of the 20 signs that you're not okay? And he's like, yeah, you can drink when it's prescribed by your doctor. So I look in the mirror, and I tell myself, have a drink. <laughs> and then Marie tells, um, oh, Marie doesn't actually tell him Norman finds out um, that Marie is suing Godfrey, and um, Norman is doing everything in his power to, like, try and tell Marie, like, don't do it, because you'll be- And she's screwed. like, she's like, you're just trying to protect them, and he's like, no, I'm really not, you're just, it's not gonna go well for you. And, um, 
then Marie keeps explaining, she's like, don't you want to know answers? And he's like, yeah, I want to know too. Yeah. Where it leaves it open, like, there isn't a clear decision on if, um, if he is uh, actually going to let her do this or not. Which I um, think makes sense, because I think he didn't make up his mind yet. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so after this, we go to Peter having another really weird dream complex, uh, right? Yeah. Peter yeah. is driving Marie to Roman's oh. house, and he drops her off, and he's like, this is where you're staying. And she's like, yeah, like, whatever. You do you know this guy? And she's like, and he's like warning her to be careful. And she goes, what? It's not like he's going to eat me. And I was like, oh. The foreshadowing is quite gigantic. I was like, oh, you're going to die. Yeah, you're not, you're, you're Aletha 2.0 in every way possible. Um, then we're inside the house and we have the scene with the screaming baby. That's um, right. Then we go to Peter and his dreams. Peter has a, uh, has a very weird dream. Uh, snakes, a porcelain doll breaking and then it all being reversed. And then he sees this like neon sign with that, with that has certain words like blurred out. It says out, gone it, sis, which is the title of the episode. And, um... And so, um, Peter's like, well, this shit's fucking whack. And so Destiny helps him by being like, yo, broski, spit in this jar. Let me drink it real quick. And I'll tell you the future in a way. And she goes on one hell of a trip. Yo, where um, my note just says Destiny's vision thing was fucked. That was extremely, I'm like, well, that looked fucking scary. Like there was like a yo. snake that was wrapped around her leg. Then like, she was like choking and like water like and. There's been a lot of stuff that's been, like, gory or weird or intense in this show, but that was the only part that was genuinely scary. Yeah, like, that was pretty horrifying to see her, you know, go in to whatever this was. Yeah, and like, so, the like, water, she's standing in the bathtub, and the water turns black, and then it turns into a snake, and then it, like, goes into her veins, and then she, like, is puking, and she almost dies, and it was... And so she stresses Peter, like, big. She's like, do not, like... She's like, leave the dreams. Do not do anything. Just leave it as it is. Stop. And then after what, this very intense scene, we go to, uh, like, a little dinner date with Roman and Miranda. They're talking about how they both have dead dads. Literally, I wrote down how desensitized Roman was when he said, yeah, my dad stuck a shotgun in his mouth when I was four, and I found his brains on the floor. And I was like, oh, that's just, wow. Good for you, Roman, I guess. And um, then I really liked the next moment because she he goes out to show her the horse and she's like, you're literally a Byronic hero. And I wrote a bunch of hearts when she said that. And then I was really glad because she went on to explain what a Byronic hero was because I thought I was going to have to explain that. But don't worry, she explained it. So if you don't know, go watch the episode, Dumbasses. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was aggressive, Mary Kate. It's 12.30 in the morning, and I'm drinking. I'm allowed to be aggressive. That is very Also, fair. Also, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my PhD in literature. I get aggressive about Lord Byron. It's a fact. <coughs> I love that for you. But also, while she's explaining this, like, amazing literature to Roman, he's like, let me kiss up on your neck. Yeah, that was weird. He's she literally, writer. so basically, a Byronic hero is not really a compliment. Kind of, but not really, but she's, because she's basically like, you're arrogant and cunning and cold on the outside, but secretly filled with rage. And he's like, gets a boner over that. Yeah, and he's like, let me kiss your neck. And then but also, like, mm. it's very accurate that a Byronic hero would get a boner over being told that he was a Byronic hero. Yeah, like that's so on point. <laughs> You're like, secretly yes. full of rage. Yes, I am. Yeah, put that tongue away. <laughs> um, so she's like, yeah, I ain't having this. I'm gonna go sleep, sleep town. And uh, she, so they leave the, uh, the, the horsies, which I still can't believe Roman bought a horse, which I think he also has a second one because, um, <laughs> There was another horse in like what looked like another little stable part of this gigantic thing. So maybe yeah. he said something on the horses. Um, so then the next scene 
is back at Godfrey and Norman is confronting Price. And he's like, I need answers. And Price is like, yo, it was just, it just happened, man. He basically told uh, Norman, it is what it is. Like, <laughs> it is most- what it is. And, and Norman's like, like, yeah, you know, I was gonna play fair. I was gonna let you give me answers. But since you're such a fucking dick, we suing your ass. He's like, we're using my money for my, uh, the money from him selling his shares of uh, Godfrey. He's like, so I'll have enough money to combat whatever you bring. He's like, so he's like, do it. Literally do your worst because we'll be prepared. Yeah. I was like, that's not going to go well for anybody. No. But I, I have a feeling that all it's go- this is going to do is cause a lot more shit. No, you know what it's going to do? It's going to cause a fight between Norman and Olivia. And he's going to have to pick his dead daughter or the thing he wants most in the world. Yeah. And my guess is that plot-wise, it would make more sense if he picked Rita. But he's a fucking piece of shit, so he's going to pick Olivia. Exactly. And then poor Marie will get fucked over once again. Speaking and of Olivia. She had this scene. She was really like, I'm going to call Ro- uh, Roman Norman and be all lovey-dovey and saying, I'm sorry I haven't been the best whatever. <laughs> and she was like, uh, She's like, I lied to myself about Roman loving me still. And maybe if I keep lying, my dreams will come true. I just, I'm so weak and I don't want you to see me like this. And I'm sorry I haven't been great, but I miss you. And I, I'm just, I was like, like, damn, Olivia, do you need like, a did they, did they, when they did a tongue replacement, did they also replace your brain? Possibly. Price was like, I, you know, like, while we're here, let me, like, readjust your brain. He's like, I'm real tired of you being a bitch. Right. <laughs> um, and, uh, but then she attempts to get her uh, coldness back by hitting the bird, the dead bird with her cane. Yeah, I'm like, you were crying over that dead bird. Yeah. And um, then we go to Roman's house where Miranda is scrubbing dub dubbing in the shower and get ready to scrub- she, Before she gets in the shower, she's looking at herself in the mirror and she's checking out her bruises because the, the, the injury from the car accident is worse than she's pretending. She's actually like really messed up. But then, and this is a, I wrote a giant question mark here. The camera right. zooms to a close up on a tattoo on her back that I have um, absolutely no idea why they did. I don't know. I, I literally wrote, I said, cool tats probably mean something. Because they well, zoomed no, in on- it, it, the zoom, the way they zoomed and lingered, it has to mean something. But and, I- And it was hummingbirds, or they were sparrows. It was either hummingbirds I or sparrows. it was a fish. It looked like a, there were like two little birds. I thought there was a water and a koi fish. I will have to go back and check. And I'll yeah, we're going to have to check out what that tattoo is because I swear to God, it was a koi fish. I know there was a fish on it, but it looked like there yeah. were two little as well. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, they spent an unnaturally long time looking at a tattoo that neither of us knew what it was because we didn't know why they were spending such a long time looking at the tattoo. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Roman is watching her take a shower. Yeah, like a creep. And then, um, guy literally wrote down Roman's being weird again. <laughs> and, um, and then we go to like this trailer park where there's this drunk man like walking around singing. Oh, not yet. No, 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 no. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. Go back to Peter's, and uh, oh, yeah. Destiny is yelling at him and about his dreams again. And then Andreas gets home. He's like, what are you guys fighting about? And she's like, nothing. I'm going to go take a shower and wash the snake off of me. And Andres is like, cool. I don't know what the fuck's going on here. But then he looks at Peter's drawing and he recognizes the word, the gone sis. And he tells him that it is the Wagoneer Oasis. And it is a, what does he call it? A trailer park for horny truckers. That's how he describes it. I love that. And, uh... So then Peter basically says, cool, uh, fuck Destiny's advice. I'm going to go find this. Yeah. 
like a dumbass. Literally, that's what Peter and Roman do best. Literally listen to nobody. Stupid. They're men. They're stupid. And now, now we're at the, the drunken, the drunken man wandering through the trailer park. And, uh, he goes through, like, the woods, and then there's a pretty gnarly, disgusting, uh, well, he hears weird Latin chanting coming from the woods. And um, as he enters the woods, we see that the, the dude who had been flaying himself in the last episode was being sprinkled with holy water and a bunch of Latin chants. But it was the same, like, bowl and, and sprinkling that, like, when Clementine got inducted into the Order of the Dragon in season one, except for it wasn't like with a unmasked priest it was with another dude who had a mask on and it was weird and sketchy and it was clearly a cult induction Initiation. but like usually when you get inducted into a cult isn't the whole cult there and not just like one dude in the woods maybe they're they're a special cult so then because the old dude saw them doing this obviously the only answer is to kill him So they do, and it is in a great way. Yeah, so it reminded me of, you know how in Halloween, when Annie's in the car and she's getting strangled and Michael Myers is clearly not good enough at strangling that he just gives up and stabs her. He should have had this dude with him. Yeah. Because he just takes a wire around this dude's neck and it's like one, two, three, blood everywhere. Yeah. It was like, like I said before in other podcasts, I don't like unnecessary blood. And this was definitely a lot. But like. If you're having like a wire around your throat. Right, like. like there was going to be a lot of blood just, like, coming it out. Was, it was just, it was more shocking than gross to me. Yeah. And especially because the other dude, so the one dude is strangling him, and the other dude is just standing there, like, basking in the blood being, like, splattered all over him. And I was like, I am the uncomfy right now. <laughs> I mean, that, that's one thing that the show's good at. Making people be uncomfy. And speaking of that, the last scene of the episode, we uh, hear a horse screaming. And then, well, okay, so we see a horse, hear a horse screaming. We don't see anything. And then we see Peter getting out of the truck at the Wagoneer Oasis. And then we flash back to Roman laying over beautiful dreamer's body, having sucked horse blood yeah beautiful dreamer really uh did not last long in hell which i saw coming from the minute he told the horse dude that his mom had all the horse ponies slaughtered i was like oh she been feeding on them young ponies yep and that was the second episode of hemlock grove season two it was definitely better than the first one but i'm still not like Hooked completely yet, or what is supposed to be happening? Yeah. Um, I, uh, but I have to say, if Miranda's like a big character for the season, they did a way better job of introducing her than they did with any of the characters in season one. Very true. Very, very true. Because it's like we know kind of about who she is, how, like, how we she is. We still have lots of questions, but we didn't waste time getting invested in other people and then throwing her in. Exactly. So, I, um, with, with that said, I think, um, I, me and Mary-Kate, I, we had talked briefly about who we are, who is our, uh, saving grace, but before we get to that, who do you want to punch? I kind of want to punch Andreas. That's fair. Because, like, 
Why you gotta be here? See, I I kind of want to punch Roman for the him being just pure stupid. Um, yeah. Like not oh wait, not Roman. Sorry, actually Peter, because yeah. he's Peter is, he's he has really done this episode. Like he's oh, doing no, okay. When Peter got grossed out that Destiny drank his spit, and she's like, "Dude, it's okay, we're cousins." But then when he thought she died, and he was trying to give her CPR. Uh, he did it super stupidly. He did not give enough chest compressions. He was like, one, two, three, okay, make out with her. Man, people and their cousins in the show, weird. Peter was just not, like, not in touch. three chest compressions is not gonna do anything. No. And, but, enough oh, with yeah, the- Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. He's a stupid. He's stupid. And then for our saving grace, I, I personally, I, I kind of like Miranda. I kind of, I liked her. I like her character. Like I said, she reminds me of me. So obviously I like her. Um, but, but for me, my saving grace was Olivia because Empathy. she has feelings. But only reason why I don't want to give too much saving grace to her is because I'll like her with feelings and she'll completely lose them and I'll go back to hating her again. Right, right. No, but like there's something really interesting about her experiencing emotions. Experiencing emotions. Because it kind of feels like, so again, because I relate everything back to the Vampire Diaries. In the Vampire Diaries, they used to have this thing where they called the humanity switch, where vampires can choose to not use their feelings. So they like turn off their humanity switch. So they lose humanity. They basically just feel hunger and pleasure and they don't have any of those like feelings that make you human, like like grief or compassion or any of those things. And then when it gets turned back on, it they like have to deal with all of the emotion that they haven't processed the whole time it's been off. Oh, damn. So like I kind of, and I see like, the crying over the bird and the remembering times that she lied to Roman and like the desperately trying to find a way to like be his mom and the missing Norman when she's usually so cold, like she's feeling so many things. And I really find it interesting because I don't, I don't know, is she really as cold as she was or is this the real her and the cold was how she dealt with it. Like, I, I like that her character has depth now. That's, that's very true. I just hope that it's something that they can carry out instead of... Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure now that I'm, like, suddenly, like, oh, wow, there's a story here. They're gonna blow it. But, but, like, I've always been intrigued by her character because she's been weird, but this is the first time I felt like there were layers to her character, and I really like that. That's fair. That's very fair. Well, any theories? I honestly, I don't know. I think there might be some more that, about the baby that's a little uh, fishy that we don't know yet. But um, I, I still don't know enough to be like having. Yeah, a I just I'm trying to figure out how they're gonna. So the other thing is this last episode was 13 or last season was 13 episodes. This one's only 10. And it's now been two episodes and we still don't have any clear line tying the cult to Hemlock Grove. Yeah. And I don't know how they're going to do that. Like we're 20% into the season. Yeah. And I get it, like it's only two episodes. So, but if there's less episodes, we got to kind of keep it. We got to pick up the pace a little bit. So hopefully yeah. next next week's episode will be that episode that's like, oh, here's all the hectic stuff happening. So. Well, I'd love to stay and talk. But it's one o'clock in the morning. And as you can tell by the slurring that just happened when I tried to say one o'clock in the morning, I am not entirely sober. And I'm tired AF. Well, Mary Kate, you go get some sleep. I'm gonna go get some food to eat, and uh, we will reconvene for next week's episode of Hemlock Grove. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
<laughs> reading a tweet. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, speaking of tweets, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at death and aliens. Send us an email at death and aliens at gmail.com because right now the only person who emails me is um, me when I send myself videos to upload to Instagram. Um, Love that. You can also follow me at mk underscore superstar spelled e-m-k-a-y. And you can follow me at Instagram at Monica dot Lynn underscore. And you can follow me on Twitter. I changed my handle because I was seeing if my original handle was open and it's still not. You can follow me at Mon underscore Lynn underscore. You changed your handle? Yeah. You can change it on Twitter. Uh, if you go to the account thing, you hit settings, and then you can tap on it, and it'll take it to your name, and it'll be like, are you sure you want to change your handle? And I'm like, yes. Oh, I guess the only problem with changing your handle is when you're verified, and then they don't really want you to change it. But since nobody cares about us, um, we're clearly not verified. Exactly. So make it happen. Make us okay. verified. Also, very quickly before I say goodbye. Last week, Monica was really excited because she got followed by this guy from this band that she really likes. And I got followed by a band on Instagram and I was really excited. I was going to share it too. And then I realized that it was um, like a fake account where somebody just like copied the name and copied all the pictures and tried to fake it. But it was of a Christian band. And like, if you're going to fake being someone's Instagram account, why would you choose a Christian rock band? Odd flex, but okay, I guess. <laughs> um, Don't worry, a different Christian rock band did follow me on Instagram, so. No. It's karma. Right. Good karma. Good karma. If I could marry a guy in a Christian rock band. If I could just marry a guy. <laughs> That'd be really cool. We'll see you guys next week. We'll see you. Peace Bye. out, Scouts.